What's up, Foot Clan? We've got the Super Bowl on Sunday. We'll be talking about some news on today's show, and then we'll dig into the tight end truth, breaking down the reality of a very interesting year at the tight end position. Do not miss a minute. Click the subscribe button and stay tuned. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. The Fantasy Footballers Podcast, Thursday. Days away from the big game. They call it the the big game. They do, which... Now that hearing you say it, it it's a little a little unlike the NFL because it's the big game, but that implies there are there's a bigger and a biggest. You're saying that bigger than big? Yeah, I thought like, you were going to say it implies the other ones are small. I'm, well, I'm saying if I'm the NFL, right. it's the biggest game. None shall be bigger. No, this, that's the, this is just a yeah, big. It's game. big. Well, they do put the in there though. The yeah, like it's the big game. Well, the mine biggest is game, the is, biggest, the game. biggest game is the Pro Bowl. We all know that. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, welcome. Did that in. happen? Yeah, I did. I did. All the it's just a whisper in the wind. I it? saw uh, Justin Tucker. Oh, I did. See winning a tic tac toe. Who's watching this stuff? I honestly, I mean, it's cool to see the highlights of it later. I saw C.J. Stroud throw a dime to Jamar Chase in a saw, flag football game. I saw Jalen Hurts hit no targets oh, at yeah, all yeah. in the quarterback challenge. It's, it's, Zero. Whenever you talk about it, it's all stuff. Oh, I would watch that. I just – You don't know I, it's – I don't ever remember the the brain – when you're the, the huge playoff weekend is done, your brain kind of just shuts down until the big game. The, well, it's not I, something you carve out of your skin. Like, if it's on and it's in front of you, you know, if I'm eating at a restaurant and that's on the I TV, I'd be like, oh, it. this is awesome. But I'm not going out of my way to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Appointment television There's stuff. There's tic-tac-toe kicking going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brooks put it pretty well here. Brooks, you said it's like what, SNL? Yep, you watch the highlights after. Yeah, I, I think that's fairly true. That's sad. That makes me sad. Once upon a time, SNL was, you know, oh, it's Saturday night. Now it's like, yeah. It's well, just, we're old. Uh, that's true. I'm I can't even tell you dirt. who's on the show anymore. Oh, don't say that. Uh, this is Jason Moore. I'm Andy Holloway. You're Mike Wright. That I am. The. Those are the three on the show. Uh, three days until Super Bowl Sunday, the UDK pre-sale begins on uh, Sunday. And you can get the UDK Plus, the Dynasty Pass, all of the content available immediately because uh, – Winning fantasy football championships, it doesn't it doesn't stop. Never. Got to put in the work. Can't stop, won't stop. And nobody wants to stop. We want to keep playing. In fact, when I was walking in here this morning, I, I was glancing, as I'm often doing, towards Deucer's Alley. And uh, Papa Josh is over there. You've got uh, Judge Giamatti, the rap scallion, this morning. But I heard Papa Josh. He was, he was talking to, to Kyle. And about he was what? talking all about his picks in the upcoming draft and how great a situation he's in. Oh, rookie picks? No. Was it rookie picks? Yeah. I got the 102 oh, I... and the 103, man. Oh, yeah. And and huge. You got Quentin Johnston, so you're set yeah. up. For the you, pe- could, you could turn – look, right now, I promise you could you could get a third. For huge? A third rounder for huge. I, right I will now. offer my third straight up for Quentin Johnston. Do you accept? I'm not sure I would offer mine, but. Well, right. That's really tempting. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get out. <laughs> um. So, yeah, yeah. Everybody's still ready to rumble. I mean, we, uh, we've got the Super Bowl. We'll have free agency, the combine, all of the draft buzz. It's going to be a good time. Today we have. More truth. Is this the final show? Oh yeah. He doesn't only one for it's only one for tight ends. He doesn't even say other things anymore. Yeah. That did, he, did he, he say like, that? That was just a button, right? This is you don't have an incentive laden contract, Brooks, where you have to 
He's, like you only get paid on days you say it. He is building a brand. He mm-hmm. really is. Oh yeah. yeah. Dot com. Yeah. Go over there. How many W's? I think that's a four burger. <laughs> Do you have to like register all of them? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. You'd have to register all those domains. Um, Jason's not wearing a hat today. Haircut day. So, oh, you got to pay. Oh. Pay Res- respect, respect to the, to the barber. Respect the barber. Make their job easier. <laughs> I had to do that the other day. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it is funny, though, that after the haircut, I will just be putting a hat back on. <laughs> like, Wait, so you, you will? Yeah, you're not going to get you're not going to show it off for a little bit. Uh, maybe a day. We'll see. Is CBD that then disrespectful to the barber? Ooh, well, it depends on if they do good or not. Right? There's not much you can do, Mike. I got can't polish yeah, what is, Are you on a per hair basis paying the highest rate possible for a haircut? Oh, absolutely. Right? Call That's out. how you should. Still going to a nice, you know, a, a higher end barber. Why get it cut if you're only going to wear a hat? I'm telling you, one of these days I'm just shaving my head. You should just shave. You Do should, it, you coward. You don't need to <laughs> shave the whole head. Just shave it like above the hat line. So you wouldn't, you know what I mean? Oh, like a, like the monk? We Yeah, like, <laughs> no, that's a, is that a fryer? The fryer, the fryer. Yeah, the fryer the cut, end. because we wouldn't know. That's we fair. would never, see how long you could go with us not knowing you shaved your head. <laughs> no. Okay, this has been fun. Quick question of the day. Do you believe Drake London will be a value pick in the 2024 fantasy <sighs> football draft season? He was a fifth round pick last year, the wide receiver 23 off the board. He finished as the wide receiver 39 a year after finishing at 35. Um, hundred and I mean, similar numbers. Six, 69 receptions, 72 the year before. Same catch rate. Similar yardage around 900. Touchdowns abysmal at two. Um, targets were the same. Snap percentage the same. He's 22 years old. To say he's a value would be to say that he will be undervalued by the majority of people and looks like his early best ball ADP is wide receiver 27. So which that's the degenerates shout out to the DJs out there already doing best ball. I think my opinion is that Drake London will be a top 24 wide receiver next year. Okay. Um, we like that, but like 23, 24. So value off of that 27 draft spot, barely. Well, that that's fine. The, the thing for Drake London is he's still – we're going into year three. I think we've – I've seen enough to know this is a this is a player who in the right circumstance could be incredible. I think that he is an excellent wide receiver. He has dealt with a with, – with bad quarterback play for his two years. He's dealt with a coach who it, it was extremely frustrating and not – using his best players as the focal point of the offense more often than not. But what I, I what I loved, you know, Raheem Morris, the new coach of the Atlanta Falcons, and you gotta you always gotta be careful with these types of things, but still for that that uh press conference to say what well, you know what excites you about the the potential of the Falcons offense. He goes, uh Drake London? Yeah. You're like for a co- head coach he to added just one more. Yeah he Bijan is thank well. you. Yes. But for him to just just come out right and and say it. Of like, I've seen this player, and it feels like in him just saying Drake London. He said, "I've watched Drake London. He has been criminally underutilized, and I'm going to figure out how to unleash him." Yeah, I mean, those weren't. Yeah, Kyle those Pitts, those were the not uh, mentioned. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, those were the assumed words. But um, you know, the way that I view Drake London, he's obviously flashed. You watch the film and you go, "Oh." He's a good one. You you haven't watched him and been like, man, he makes a lot of mistakes. He should have got that ball. He should have broke that tackle. He, his opportunities weren't great, and his quarterbacks aren't great. Right now, under contract, are Taylor, uh, Taylor Heineke and Desmond Ritter. They're both under contract in 2024. I don't know that they're going to go out and find someone else. And if the quarterback doesn't change, I do not believe that Drake London is going to have a great year. So will he be – a value? Probably not. That being said, when you're 22 years old and you're that talented, if you're talking about drafting him as the wide receiver 27, it's not a bad it's not it, a bad chance to just take a young, explosive athlete that still has a path towards breaking out. He is in the category of some of the few players that could have a breakout season. 
like a big breakout season. Yes. Why, you know the Heisman house commercials? You seen those? Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, because apparently all the Heisman winners, they all live together in a big house. Yeah. yeah. There is another house. I don't know if you knew this. Oh, let, let me hear. It's not as nice of a house. It's where Terry McLaurin lives. It's where mm. DJ Moore used to live mm. for it's like a two, many years. It's like a two bedroom. It's yeah. It's a it's beat up. It's mold, and I do worry that Drake London may move in because that this is we're talking the exact same way that we talked about Terry McLaurin, hundred percent. Which is I don't like his quarterback. We know the talent is there. He always makes big plays, and then you just you're just like playing. It's like the record is on repeat, right? It, yeah. And so we're we're not close enough to where you would ever say Drake London can't break out. But I think Jason's right. I mean, what are your odds? Your odds are rookie quarterback or existing quarterback. Which the GM has said, essentially, it's not Ritter. Okay, so Taylor Heineke, rookie, or... They go hard after, you know, some other option. and Yeah, and, and you're going to say Russell Wilson, and that's not great. Uh, that's not great. But, uh, there's been rumors of Justin Fields, uh, who obviously did support DJ Moore enough this last year. I don't know that that's great. Obviously, if they were to go get a Kirk Cousins, I'd be all over Drake London. I'd be thrilled. Uh, yeah, be, he would not be a value. He no. Just, because his ADP he would, just would skyrocket. Be a it's very not, good fantasy asset. It's not the house of hope, Brooks. It's the house of, of false hope. That's the house. There it is. And um, DJ Moore, I mean, he packed his bags, right? Is he out front the house now? Is waiting to be picked up? Yeah, he's waiting on he, the did Uber. Did he move out? He's No, he's waiting on the Uber, but he is no longer inside that little apartment. That's what I think. Yeah. So Terry McLaurin gets the master suite of that home. <laughs> Come on. Um, no yeah, more guy out. But Drake London is a, a legit – He all he needs is targets. Like, if you gave Dr- Drake London 150 targets – I still think they need to be good targets – well, but but just ex- Ritter targets. Just extrapolating what he did this year, at least you'd be sitting there at 85, 90 receptions, twelve hundred yards. Yeah, that is the fair. touchdowns are not coming without a better quarterback and a better system. Yeah, last year we had a game of nine for one twenty five against Washington and ten for one seventy two against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The not that, not every wide receiver in, that means in the had, NFL can do that. That means he had like six hundred or five hundred oh, yeah. yards in the other. 16 games. Yes. Painful. Uh, but that's, that's you know, it's hard to find a quarterback. That's it is. That's what I'm learning. All right, let's talk some news. News and notes from around the league. <laughs> Andy's covering his face and chuckling. I don't know what. You know, Kyle has a way to disrupt the show sometimes. Is this the photographs of greg this roman can't be the same person <laughs> there's no way this is the same person kyle wow how dare you this man has lived four lives I, dude, i'm I sorry admi- this is terrible for the podcast but our show doc ha- so the chargers I admire this the chargers officially hired greg roman as their offensive coordinator we just talked on the last show about the fact that uh, you know, uh, we liked the idea of maybe Saquon landing in Los Angeles, and we knew Greg Roman was probably coming on board. We didn't know at the time that it was going to be officially the offensive coordinator position. But Kyle has pasted pictures of his time in San Francisco, Buffalo, Baltimore, um, and then, you know, he spent a year off. This man has gone through. Th- that third picture cannot be real. He has reinvented his look many times. And he got there. Like, he's progressed through some bad times to get to a final visual that's like okay all right this is fine <laughs> hey, for you haven't we all <laughs> i can't help but notice that the very first picture his hairline is somewhat similar to jason's today and the next three hats, hats <laughs> in all three pictures yeah is this jason's future i've oh yeah well i'm not looking forward to picture three <laughs> we gotta we gotta tweet this out i guess i hope get... i'm past picture three i hope picture three was like two you years already ago. had yeah, picture three is over yeah, good. But you got to get the gray, yeah, well, we, get the we, gray beard. We got to tweet this lineage out. I, I'm shocked. I, the third one is a different person. That's that's an actor. That's somebody else. Um, the Chargers hired Greg Roman. The Chargers are going to run the crap out of the football. Greg Roman has been an offensive coordinator for the better part of a decade. I mean, this is this is not someone we are unfamiliar with. And it's not just, well, this team and this personnel, you know, he was the the Niners, the Bills, 
and the Ravens, all three doing the exact same thing, which is being basically top three in rushing attempts usually and bottom three in passing attempts usually. That's literally how extreme it is almost every single year of his career for all those different teams. They want to run the ball. Now, my biggest concern with Harbaugh, Greg Roman, is obviously Harbaugh is coming off a tremendous run, national title. What if it doesn't work? Because I think it is going to be the philosophy. I think it's going to be what he wants to do at the NFL level. I do have a bit of a concern that it just doesn't work the way he wants it to work. I think it will work. Well, he's going to need a running back, and, and the updated news that we got is the Giants are not expected to use the franchise tag for a second straight season on Saquon. Seems like Barkley's heading for free agency. I personally also would not be shocked if they signed him to a deal, the Giants. Um, but They have to do something. If, you, if you're trying to be – if your goal that you have set on day one is we will be dead last in passing attempts, you better go out and get yourself a running back. Yeah, Josh Kelly, not gonna do no, not gonna do the trick there, and Austin Eckler's probably not coming back. So they have a salary cap issue. That's the biggest thing is that you know we can hypothesize about a big signing of Saquon, but there's no money, so they'd have to do something. Yeah, I mean it, the NFL always blow. They've blown my mind enough to where it's like, oh, this team doesn't have money. You can figure it out. You. Sign you, things, they, cut things, move things around. It's and forty-four up. million over the cap. It shows up eventually, though. Like, look at the 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 Saints. Like, right? It it does get <laughs> the the creditors do show up eventually. But, but like five years ago, I remember the Saints being like, "We're here," and then it's like they they keep going. So I don't know. The salary cap keeps increasing. I will say this, and this is important for all dynasty players. Like, we had a dynasty show yesterday come out talking about this upcoming rookie draft class. There's a couple guys that I, I, I think are, are pretty talented. Overall, it's a very weak draft class. This is not – I don't think NFL teams are looking to this year's draft class and saying – You're saying in my, totality? In totality. In, in totality, this is, uh, I believe, to be Not a just weaker, the running back position. No, 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 no. Just the running back position. Oh, Sorry. you didn't specify that. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So just – well, I was talking about the running back episode we did – um, on the Dynasty show that came out yesterday. Make sure you, you're listening to the Dynasty pod. Um, but the running backs are a weak draft class. And there's a lot of free agents. Like it, it, My point is, for Saquon, his market is better because there isn't like a couple of real blue-chip prospects. You've got Derrick Henry, Josh Jacobs, Saquon Barkley, Tony Pollard, um, Austin Eckler, Devin Singletary, DeAndre Swift. There are those are the free agent running the, backs available. In contrast, there aren't really running backs projected to go in the top two rounds. Exactly. So yeah, it, it's it's a good point. It'll be very interesting to see what they end up with. To see if Justin Herbert runs more, I think it, he will. If he doesn't, I mean, it, it, it's a leap to say that he's going to. That's going to become a huge part of his game, in my opinion. Well, I don't, especially with the injuries he's dealt with. So I could it happen? Yes. Do we have? He is not Josh Allen. I know his physical stature is Josh Allen, but his his instincts to run yes. the football are not the same as Josh Allen. Um, his and the physicality, the, yeah, the history. The right? dog. Does he have the dog in him? Is he willing to risk his physical well being on a regular basis? Right. I I don't think he's ever going to be someone running for six hundred yards no. by any means. But I do think every game will have one or two designed runs to utilize his athleticism because of the scheme and that that'll that'll up him to maybe a 350 400 yard rushing player i mean he's had 300 rushing yards before mike williams is a 32 million dollar cap hit which is the number two in all the nfl at wide receiver but hold on who's number one keenan allen yeah it is <laughs> oh, man. so keenan allen a 34 million dollar cap hit which I, I don't seeing it now is like that could be actually. I mean, that's some leverage for Keenan Allen to come into this team and say, "Hey, we've got a we have a salary cap problem. Why don't you uh, why don't you give me a little extension here? Why don't we spread this money out? Give me some more guarantees." Yeah, they may get some uh, some upfronts there. All right, uh, Brooks, you threw in Super Bowl score predictions since this is our last show before the Super Bowl 
Right now, San Francisco minus two has been the line. I think it's kind of stayed there. Am I wrong? Uh, it I'm pretty sure the KC between, but plus two has been. But it been has been the Forty ers favored. Yes, I. I can't. Dis- I, I'm going to go contrarian. For everybody I know on the planet is picking Kansas City. I do not think they win the football game. I well, think- not not the betters. No, I know. <laughs> but yes, yes, the betters. I Wait, mean, no, the betters are picking San. Wait, did you say everyone's picking San Francisco? I understand the what the line is, but I'm saying everybody that I know is picking uh, okay, is taking okay. Kansas City plus two. Um, so you're going contrarian. The money with is the on favorite. Kansas City. Kyle's confirming that. KC money line is the most popular bet right now. I am taking San Francisco to win the ball game. Okay. I I, have, I can't escape it. I just think they get it done this time. Okay. So that's my pick. What? You want to score? Yeah, I want to score. 27-24. Okay. Go. Jay, what do you got? I've got 24-17 Chiefs. Okay. I'm going 27-13 Kansas City. Yeah. All right. There you go. See, I told you. Everyone, I told the, you. But I'm, but I'm taking at this desk. I'm taking a big win. Yeah. All right. Uh, quick break. Come back with the truth. All right, Kyle. We have you on the uh, on the microphone today, right? Correct. You and Betts. I haven't heard your predictions for the game. What are they? We'll be giving them on the DFS and betting oh, podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, no, you'll be giving the them for the second oh, time. He's, he's taking the Niners. You're taking the Niners? Yes. What's Betsy doing? I think Betsy's taking the Niners, too. We got to fade the public. See? See my people. My people are with me. Okay. Okay. There it is. All right. Into the truth we go. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! But more importantly, uh, heads or tails? I think heads this year. <laughs> Man, he is contrarian. <laughs> you've, you've heard what never fails. Yeah, I mean, by the way, that implies you're the public. You two. I think you two are the public. That's fine. Because okay. Kyle's fading you. Yeah. Now, Kyle always fades public yes on all things yes right he is a contrarian yes he likes to zag <laughs> um i guess jason is the voice of public opinion so that makes perfect sense right. yeah go chiefs that's how your voice used to be back in uh about Toronto. five or six years ago yeah. all right the truth of the tight end position in 2023 i think this is one of the more fascinating episodes for the truth mm-hmm we had the most tight end receptions in NFL history this past year, almost 2,700. And we kind of felt it. We did. In fact, uh, I I don't know if it got put into our show doc, but I saw the top 10 performances at the tight end position this year in fantasy points. So, um, you know, big time fantasy production on a week to week basis. Eight different tight ends comprise the top 10 performances which was uh, Kelsey, Ingram, Kittle, Laporta, Hawkinson, Komet, Najoku, and Andrews. So the most receptions ever, um, 23% of all completions went to the tight end position. You had a rookie emerge who is now going as the number one best ball tight end next year in Sam Laporta. Not a lot of people picked that. Some people would have said, you know, they had their uh, excitement about Dalton Kincaid before the season, not Laporta. And uh, you had, you know, kind of a late career breakouts of Najoku and Ingram's continued. But you did not have touchdowns. And it was the fewest receiving touchdowns to the tight end position since 2011. So, and it was by a lot. So Sam Laporta had 10 of them. No one else had more than six crazy and so we had tons of receptions ppr value players you could count on like like i think ingram is kind of the best example of the season of the whole season at tight end position where like he was targeted like crazy especially in the second half but the touchdowns you know there weren't there weren't a lot of them 
Yeah, so I mean, it's funny because if you just look at stat accumulation over the you know, like the first three quarters of the season, Evan Ingram had so many targets, so many receptions, and hadn't really been that good for fantasy. Like, you know, it's like it's it's almost like how can you do that? Touchdowns have always been the way that tight the tight end position becomes relevant on a week to week basis. You're always looking for who's going to get the touchdown, and they just didn't come this year. I think that's an outlier especially with the targets being up that it, it you know if targets are more consistent than touchdowns year to year so well, i was, like the fact that there's some new blood in the nfl at the tight end position to to say okay maybe for fantasy purposes next year we we have more than just like a 1a and 1b and then garbage overall the targets for the tight end position were up but in the red zone where the action is at for scoring they were actually down where 2020-2021, about 30% of red zone targets went to the tight end position, and that went down all the way to under 25% this year. Yeah, it, it's wild. And to Jason's point, like, I I want to take a late tight end. That's what I want to do. I don't want to be in the position where we finally have been in the past couple of years where we're like, well, if you don't get A or B, you don't have one. So I'd rather have a handful. Of, I mean, I think it's interesting. There are names next year like Kincaid, like Njoku, that are going to be, you know, I don't think Njoku is going to get moved way up draft boards because of the finish. Not way up. Um, so that'll be a player people can take a flyer on. Mm -hmm. If it continues, it's great. Ingram was a late pick this year. Still provided value week to week. You've got Trey McBride. Yeah, Trey McBride <laughs> is number yeah. three in best ball ADP right now. Which is <laughs> That's wild. It's a, like, let's calm that down. Hey, that's fun. We love it. But. I believe Mike, when he revealed this to us, because <laughs> yesterday he had us guess. He said, who's number one? We go, ah, Laporta. And he's like, yep. Who's number two? Kelsey. Yep. And then we went through like 10 names. It was like. <laughs> at, yeah, at three. You know, Andrews and Kincaid and. Kittle. Yep. And, yeah. No, it was. And then Najoku. And nope. Nope. It was Trey McBride. And then Mike said, quote, that's a problem. <laughs> But, I mean, there there are other tight ends, too, that we, we're not going to discuss because they had injuries and stuff. But like Darren Waller, like he's still going to be playing football next year. Sure. So there's going to be some names. We're looking at the truth. The metrics we're using for consistency include great games. That is 15 or more points at the position. Good games, eight or more. Bust games, fewer than five and a half. We don't count missed games towards consistency. But Sam Laporta finished the year as the number one tight end with a consistency rank of three. First half, consistency of three. Second half, four. 59% good games, including starting his career at 12, 8, and 1 for the first three weeks, which I think blew everybody away. I believe I traded Sam Laporta in week four, uh, before week four, in our league of record in a deal to acquire Travis Kelsey. And it was under the premise of, hey, let's cash in on what I viewed was unsustainable production from a rookie tight end. And uh, did you regret it? You know, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I think production between Kelsey and Laporta, it was, you know, it was similar for quite a while. Laporta finished the season so strong. I won the championship anyway, so I didn't care. Things like that. Yeah. But okay. I think my regret would have been much stronger had I uh, had I not won. But 35% great games, only 18% bust. Great against good and bad defenses. Really good at home. 14.89 fantasy points at home, eight on the road. Makes Dude, sense to yep. correlate to, you know, we talked about Jared Goff, how good he was at home, how good he was against the bottom half defenses. So it makes sense that. He threw more touchdowns in those games, and that is, you know, you brought it up earlier. Laporta had so many more touchdowns than anyone else at the position. That's why he finished number one. So the question in everybody's mind is going to be, I mean, I just revealed the truth of his consistency as a rookie, which he set tons of records, most receptions, most uh, tied Gronk for the rookie tight end record. But should he be drafted as the tight end one next season? I think that's – going to be our debate all offseason yeah it will be um it, I, I probably will be out on that i this is not me saying i don't think laporta is good i think laporta showed everyone he's he's got a, 
a re- I mean, first of all, he's from tight end university. He's physically everything you want in a tight end. But then you've got the natural instincts of finding the open spot, leaking out at the right time, faking defenders. Like he he put it all together, and he's worthy of being. Like I assume next year he's going to have a good pick. But considering we only have one year and that he went to double-digit touchdowns, which is not necessarily – we don't know if that's sticky for him. Um, It'll be hard to invest how high he's going to be going and take him as the first tight end off the board because you would just assume, well, he was a rookie, so he's going to be better. That's not always what happens in the second year of players, especially after a huge rookie sensation. Yeah, I mean, I think it – my personal opinion is stuff like this is probably more sticky at tight end. Um. My, I guess my question would be, one, is what does that equate to? Is the tight end one going off the board at the end of the second this year? Is it the top of the third? Yeah, it certainly won't be a first. People aren't going to spend a first-round no, pick on Laporta the way that Kelsey was the fourth or fifth pick this past season. So um, it, it'll be interesting. Right. I, I'm, I'm probably with you in that in that regard, but of all the places where it, it can get sticky, I mean, tight end is one of them. Yeah, I mean that. That sounds that's a weird sentence. <laughs> that's just a weird sentence. Yeah, I wish I said it differently. Yeah, I, but I mean, you didn't. Of you, all the places, yeah, of all the places, you had Jamison Williams miss the training camp, beehives, the, the, the first part of the season, <laughs> movie theater floors, and mm-hmm. um, and he's looked better as of late. So with an off season next year, I think he'll be more involved, not be like that forty percent snap player. I don't know that that makes a huge effect on Laporta, but that's at least a path for targets to go elsewhere. Believe it or not, the number two tight end, and this is this is done by total fantasy points produced this year, not fantasy points per game. So that's an important thing to note because this player finished at two, but in fantasy points per game he would have been six. Evan Ingram. Evan Ingram drafted as the tight end eight, ends up at two in overall scoring, 53% good, 18% great, 24% bust. And, you know, the number was the, I mean, 143 targets for 114 receptions. He was, what, two away from breaking the record? Mm-hmm. Or uh, breaking or tying. So when you talk about values at the tight end position, Ingram was uh, extremely valuable for your team. This is I want to do this next year. I want to take the eighth tight end off the board. It is better for my team if you can identify the guy that's going to finish in the top three or four and draft them at eight or nine off the board, that's a great pathway to success. And a lot of people won late in the season with like David Njoku and, and things like that. So um, it lets me draft more of my twosie positions. That's my ideal situation. I want to find next year's Evan Ingram. That's going to be the goal. Super consistent. Not necessarily your weak winner, the way that Laporta would do it because he only scored four times. But at the very end of the year, it's been back-to-back seasons now where Evan Ingram from week 13 on has been pretty incredible for yeah, your it's team. Wild. Like they all their players like they get forgot. injured through the year. Well, it's it's like they forgot, oh hey, we can go to this guy over and over and over. And I don't and, think they forgot. No? No, because uh, the targets were I mean, like, eight, 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 seven, 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 yeah, ten, it, seven. They, they did it a little bit more at the end, but you had that's what I mean. You know, just that, like at the beginning of the he season, he just scored. He scored all four of his touchdowns from week thirteen on. He never scored a touchdown yeah. before week thirteen. Give Ingram the ball. Good things but, happen. But they did. <laughs> they did give him the they ball. They gave him the ball. Ton. A hundred reception pace, yeah. and he had no touchdowns. And we need more. <laughs> yeah. The, I mean, if all you care about is Evan Ingram, yes, you're right. Uh, he, and he needs more. That's all I care oh, about. But he correlated with uh, Travis Etienne's touchdowns. Right. Like ETN was touched on heavy in the top half of the year. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you you, you can't have two players scoring uh, the touchdown on the same play. Uh, you know, my, my only issue with Evan Ingram, 26% of his total season's fantasy points came in two weeks. Came in that big, monstrous explosion week against uh, the Browns where he scored 27 points. And then the last week, you could tell, uh, at least you yeah. know, watching, yeah. they are just trying to get him the record as they force – feed well, him the ball he was close that's that's exactly sort of. you guys yeah. had recorded that show where jason you were debating whether uh-huh. yeah. they would go for it. i was listening because i wasn't on that show but when the record was that close i 100 percent was on J- mike's side because i was like they're gonna try to get him the record 
which they really they really tried they really to, tried but to then the game 13 be, targets you know the game became like a problem for them playoff wise but that was week 18 nobody played like that didn't matter for your fantasy teams um they gave up on Calvin Ridley's target per route run situation in the first half of the year too so that went up for Ingram when they said okay this guy's not consistent and that was a big difference so right now i mean here's me, here's my belief about Evan Ingram I believe that the the Jacksonville Jaguars are going to invest a very very important pick or free agent uh, signing on a wide receiver that they want to be a big bodied help for Trevor Lawrence, and I think that that will mean that this is the best year you've seen from Evan Ingram. Yeah, Evan Ingram is very mid to me. He and and that is so how you, the, you just uh, you just threw a spike through Mike's heart. The the the. the I mean, we're talking about the truth, right? The truth is he didn't bust a lot he, because he had so many targets. He didn't help you win a lot either. He was just okay. That's what he was all season. Didn't miss a game. He was okay for the majority of the season. And, and I think that that is excruciatingly fair because he did not have a top six finish in the first 12 weeks of the season at tight end. So if you're not in the upper half of your entire league scoring mm -hmm. for 12 consecutive weeks – you did not help. Yeah, eh, I would. I would disagree. Of like, if you go go look through weekly rankings of who's actually in the top ten, and on a weekly basis, I don't know. I don't have an actual number in front of you, but it's going to be littered with guys who were you didn't even think about starting because they had two catches for five yards and a touchdown. Where over, well, over the first like Evan Ingram seven point four. This is half point scoring seven point four eight seven ten point two nine point four. That's the whole first month. Like. I those are numbers that I would take at the at the tight end position. Especially oh, you said you that perfectly. What they're Twice. ones I would take. Yeah. yeah, we'd all take them. I mean, that's what I said. He didn't bust, but he didn't yeah. really help you like win either. So if that's what you're looking for, he wasn't bad. I'm not saying bad tight end. He was the number two tight end on the season. Your opponent wasn't DMing you or texting you at the end of the week for the first 13 weeks and going, "Stupid Evan Ingram." Yeah, he got me. Yeah, it's, it's Which, fine. He's, that's it, fine. He is an he is an important part of this offense. I think even if they invest another uh, great pick in a wide receiver, obviously they're they're probably losing Calvin Ridley, so I don't see that as a big change. I think Evan Ingram next year is a lot of what he was this year, which is a, an important part of their offense. PPR dependent. PPR dependent, and you just hope. I mean, touchdowns aren't sticky, right? He only had four this year. If he ends up with eight next year, it's going to end up as a good tight end. It's going to be his eighth year. Is that right? Uh, let me look here. One, two, three, four, First five, six, seven. It will be his eighth year. Yeah, I mean, credit where credit is due. Finished at two in overall accumulation of stats. His career high in touchdowns is six in his rookie year. Three, three, one, three, four, four. Yeah, so he's not a touchdown. The odds guy. are not high there. Um, because that's not his. He's his makeup is to you know he's a, he's a really agile. Um, he's a short area guy. Tight end. He's not Laporta. Um, but. Got to give him credit, but we're just talking our opinion on on the future. Travis Kelsey finished at three. <clears throat> this is the this is interesting. Drafted as a tight end one, his consistency rank was number one. I don't like it. <laughs> his first half number one, <laughs> second half six. He still had you know I just talked about in the first twelve weeks Evan Ingram had zero top six finishes. Kelsey had one two three four five six seven. So I got texts for seven different weeks where my opponent was like, screw you and Travis Kelsey. Yes. And that's what is very powerful in the position. Now, the very end of the year was tough. 13, 14, 15, 16, and, and championship week, like the playoffs, this is the first time you like you were actively hurt by having Kelsey. Yeah, I mean, the, the actual three playoff weeks, he was the tight end 24, 21, and 37. Now, the rest of the season was so good that he ends up as – you know the the truth metric is is number one. Um, He's also number one in fantasy points per game. Yeah, I mean he he tied. It, it really sucks because he was so much worse than you hoped. He was still Travis Kelsey, and over the course of the season, the number one point per game tight end had so much greatness in the first half of the season. Early on, it just seemed like man, I was so right to get that number five pick. You know, spin that first rounder on Kelsey, but. No one won a championship with him because of the 
just the happenstance that the last three weeks of the fantasy playoffs were basically his three worst games of the season. Now, we have a Super Bowl to be played on Sunday, but he has been dominant in the playoffs. Yes, he has. If you look at the numbers, and I think it's very interesting to look at the consistency numbers from, from Kelsey over the last three years, he's had basically the exact same percentage of good games. Which is fifth? Uh, what is that number? Not fifteen or more. It's um, eight or more. Eight or more. So seventy-five percent in twenty twenty-one, seventy-six percent last year, seventy-three percent this year. So those numbers stayed the same. His bust percentage last year was zero. This year it's back up to twenty. In twenty twenty-one, it was twenty-five. So last year was really wild, and his great game percentage last year was fifty-three percent. That was insane. Yes. This year, twenty-seven percent. That's the twenty twenty one was thirty eight percent. So you kind of got a reversion to twenty twenty one in some ways. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we we you know we said this. It's hard to you know know it, but like there's no way he was going to completely repeat the the otter sheer domination. Of, otter. Yep. Otter. Like the, yeah. like the animal. Oh, he just hates otters. He dominates otters. What's wrong with otters? I I love otter. I, this isn't a me thing. This is a Travis Kelsey hates said, otters. Hmm. I mean, everybody knows that. What do that. otters do? They swim. swim. <laughs> and they but they're bark. not the one. See, I get, I get otters. I get them mixed into the beaver yeah, category. They're, they're not and the beavers are build, they're building things, and the otters are what? Just swimming up to them and turning around? They're like, yeah, like buddies. But they're hanging out, right? Yeah. Do they right. have See, big tails? I get them confused with seals. Ooh. Otters? Yeah. Otters I think of as freshwater. An otter is small. Like a freshwater otter. otter They're I'm smaller. Lo- yeah, thin. I'm looking it up. They're far smaller and cuter than I Are they in the <laughs> ocean? No. So well, they're, no, they're okay. So seals, Jason, seals are in the ocean. That's yeah. your that's the line you need to okay. figure out. I gotta remember that. Thank you. The singer. Um, all right. <laughs> Travis Kelsey next year. Uh, I think you're on the uh the one year rental plan. You're on the waiting for the expiration, you're on the Derek Henry plan. Where's he gonna go? I think he'll still still go pretty high in the draft, but he Laporta will be the tight end one consensus. And then Kelsey will be there probably what, third round? I'm guessing. Third round Kelsey is going no one will have the fortitude to pass on that. That's yeah, I, I don't, don't think anybody. I don't even think So late second then? Late second I wouldn't do it, but I think that's where he'll go. Okay. It's too tantalizing. The The end of the season was just so destructive of your of, of all of our view on Travis Kelsey. Of, but, but, like but, peop, people were like legitimately mad in fantasy football at Travis Kelsey, who two week 14 was still having a fantastic it year. It was three games for a player who has the most consistent record you could ever look to. And so if he was I'll, I'll put it this way, if he was 30 years old, you would not even you none of us would be talking about it. No. no. Three games, you would not even mention it. You'd be like take him in the first yeah, round. Yeah, you go that sucked. But. So so it's three games combined with being 34 years old that makes you think, "Oh, we're all sitting here with bated breath saying, "Oh, when's he going to fall apart?" That's why the playoffs matter to me. The fact he's dominated in the playoffs, he's probably going to be fine. He says he's not done playing. Yeah, he he emphatically said that he said he's loving this why would he ever walk away so i'll take him in the third okay if he's there (laughs) all right let's take a break let's come back with a uh a player that was dynamic incredible and now we're stuck wondering what's going to be number four tj hawkinson Drafted as the tight end four, fourth round pick. First half of the year, number four in consistency. Started the year at number six, number one, and number eight. Great start, 60% good, 20% great, which what that's uh, that's not too far off of where Kelsey was. But he didn't bust. 7% bust games, and then he got hurt. And then he tore his ACL. And then he didn't get surgery for a while because it, it just happened. So what are we what are we hearing first on the injury front from Betsy? The injury front is basically the the timeline is such that you would expect him to start on the pup if he somehow um, and he will be ahead of schedule because that's he is all, right now. Yeah, it, 
the the there is no player not ahead of schedule. Um, if but if somehow he makes it to week one, you would expect that he would not be at one hundred percent strength. I, I think it'll be really really surprising if he doesn't start the season on the pup, and you're dealing with an injured player who's just normal timeline after this surgery says he's not back until later in the season. Like I could see it being, you know, I, I think when we did the math on what is normal expected that would have been about Halloween from his surgery date. Let me ask you this because Hawkinson through the first 12 weeks would have also pushed the all time reception record. He was on pace for 113. So he would have been in the same boat as Ingram. He also had five touchdowns in that span. You give him another couple. He would have been the only other player above that six mark. We know if Kirk Cousins is back, this is a go-to receiver. And yet you have the injury. So will he be a player that somebody is going to be willing to put on their bench for a while that so will that be... you have somebody potentially elite when they return? Or do you not expect him to return to form immediately? Well, and I would also bring up, like, over the first six weeks, uh, you know, it started out okay, the tight end six in week one uh, with uh, – sorry, trying to pull up those points. It was seven and a half. So – as Jason would say, that's not good enough. Yeah, it didn't win you the week. Right. Didn't bust. Had a huge week, too. But then, like, f weeks three through six, you know, you had a four-game span where he's just – he's kind of okay. His real dominant stretch there, which was weeks uh, seven through 12, let's, let's put it there, those are no Justin Jefferson weeks. Like, he clearly benefited with the, the target share going up. You had – Eight games where he played with Jefferson, seven without, and 5.6 receptions with Jefferson. That jumps up to over seven. His touchdowns jump from like .25 up to almost a half a touchdown a game. I mean, so it's like the, there was a really big difference for Hawkinson, and that was healthy Hawkinson uh, when Justin Jefferson was out. So I think Ham that, Hawk. Yeah, like, that is a – and that's a kind of a – like a sneaky – if you're not paying attention to everything, you just look and go, oh, man, it, it took a little bit for Hawkinson to get going, but then he was great. When did they lose Cousins? They lost Cousins in week eight. So really what you want to look so at that's is those a, first five that's weeks. That's a crazy combo, too, yeah. too. So the first five weeks, let's take a look at the first five weeks, and if you extrapolate that over the course of the season, what would he have done? He would have finished with 102 receptions, okay. which is great. Mm -hmm. 863 yards, which is awful on 100-plus receptions and 6.8 touchdowns, basically averaging 10 fantasy points per game. That's above average for sure. Um, That's that is, Evan Ingram. Yeah, I, I was, yeah, literally, exactly. Evan Ingram only had 963 <laughs> yards on 114 catches. But say, I, I think Ingram, let me just double check it, but Ingram averaged 10.2 fantasy points. Yeah, so that's Evan Ingram. It, it's, it's not as good as what you hope for. He's coming off of. A, a very late injury, so you would expect when he's back. Is there a chance he's not drafted? Uh, I don't think so. If, think he, if he starts the year on pup? Yeah, I mean, it, obviously in IR leagues, if you've got an IR spot, he's yeah. going to be one of your favorite, like, oh, round eight, round yeah. nine, take him and stash him. Might and, be later than that. Yeah, may, maybe, but I will say that if, if peak health, he's averaging 10.1 fantasy points per game, you would imagine right when he's back, I don't know, he takes a little hit. And if, if you're stashing a guy for eight fantasy points a game when he comes back, might not be worth it. George yeah. Kittle comes in at five, 30 years old, drafted as the tight end three, consistency rank of four. First half was fifth in consistency. Second half was second. The second most consistent tight end over the second half of the year. 38% great games. That's a huge number. It's higher than Kelsey. Um, I believe, let me take a quick look. Is that higher than Laporta? Laporta was 35, yeah. Yes. So uh, you talk about like hot, cold, red, green. It's what I, what he's always been. It's always been maddening of knowing what George Kittle could do if he were unleashed, but he is only – that only happens in the, some of the time. It's it's not every single week that you even have the chance uh, three that, straight that's going to be a George Kittle game. Three number one overall weeks to tight end, a number two – a number three, he's a thirty-eight percent bust, thirty-eight percent great. Yeah, exactly. He's a roster construction question of like, do you want 
to have a weak winning capability at tight end, knowing that you will also get bust weeks that actively hurt you. Is that worth it at the tight end position? And to me, that's a matter of what am I giving up where he's drafted. You know, when he's being drafted. You were out on him this year, 100%. I, I, I was out on him. He was in the fourth round. He was a fourth round pick. And I felt like the players that you're selecting in the fourth are still really, really good. Um, now, I mean, he ha he helped people win a lot of weeks. I don't think it was necessarily a win or a loss to be out on Kittle this year because he was so boom bust. Well, let's go to let's go live to the field here. Okay, Brooksy. Yes, sir. George Kittle is your tight end in Dynasty. Is yeah, this correct. Yep. What was your vibe? How did it feel? What was the ride like? Are you buying tickets again? Uh, it was pretty good this year. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. It, it's just nice to know that he is a guy you can put in your lineup every time, and he has that potential. And it matters. Kind of deal with the rest. It's him versus Evan Ingram is like the, the philosophical. Yeah, that is the yeah. what kind of yeah. fantasy player are you? Do you want to just like Evan Ingram will be a safer on a weekly basis, but his ceiling will never hit. What so George let me ask you, what kind of player are you? I think I'm in the Kittle versus Ingram side. I, I, I would prefer Kittle to Ingram. Yeah, for okay. ADP still Ex matters. So. Exactly. It's a, it, you have to factor in what you're giving up, which is the whole reason I was out on George Kittle is not because I think he's bad. I would love to have a George Kittle. It's just would you rather have a George Kittle in the fourth or an Evan right. Ingram in the eighth? The the splits are wild, guys. I don't know if you saw the, the home road splits. Oh, my God. Goodness. At home, he averaged over 15 points per game, and on the road, under seven. Wow. So he's, draft, a, he's, a, he's a hype man. This is, you get, he likes the crowd. You get two tight ends is what you do, <laughs> and you just play George Kittle when he's at home. David Njoku came in at six, guys. He was sixth in consistency, but over the second half of the year, he was number one. Oh man, that he finish was so good. Tight end two, two, three, three. Yeah, the last four weeks was That's an a good unbelievable finish, but really from week seven on, which is crazy, right? Seven on, he was just unbelievable. Yeah. Um nine point two targets per game in, in that stretch, six plus receptions in six of the final seven games. Had to deal with four quarterbacks over the course of the entire year and yet delivered really an impressive, meaningful fantasy finish. Um, first in yards after catch, I mean, he caught – every crossing route he caught, he would just run wild. He was really hard to tackle for these guys. And, and the neat thing about him, he's a big, strong guy that can break tackles, but oftentimes when he caught the ball, it wasn't him breaking tackles. It was him just running away from guys. Uh, he's a supreme athlete. He's still very young. Even though he's been in the league, this will this upcoming season will be his eighth, like Evan Ingram. They came in together, but he was drafted as like a 12-year-old man-child yeah. uh, back eight years ago. So it's neat to see him break out. I think his breakout was so dominant that as an organization, as a coaching staff, you say, how can we get him part of this game focal plan? Every point. A focal yeah. point of the offense. I will be much more in on him than um than I I thought I would be based on how he played with Deshaun Watson because he wasn't as good with Watson. You know, he dealt with four theoretically inferior quarterbacks than than Voldemort later in the season, but he was better with them. You're talking seven well, he was, fantasy points. He was points. better with Flacco, right? Yes. It, uh, yeah, but he, I mean, he was good even in uh, non-Flacco games. Uh, 10.6 fantasy points per game without Deshaun Watson, 7.6. Uh, one fantasy points with Deshaun Watson. The, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious what those numbers were. The, the month non Flacco, run, but say the the month run where it, he gave you, uh, what is like the Kyle's showing the the best the fifth best four games final four game span for a tight end over the last decade where he was the two two three three. Those were all Joe Flacco games. So that's the 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 real question, Jason. You think you laid it out. Did he force the organization to figure something out? Because it will take, it will still take a bit of a leap of faith. Because we, you, hit the dominance, none of the the dominance was with Watson. He had 123 targets this year, which was more than 30 
above his career high. And the dude he burnt had, his face off. He had 23. That's right. We forgot about that. He had 23 receptions. That's a man. More than his, his career high. He had his career high in receiving yards. He had his career high in receiving touchdowns. I, I, I do think he... And he burnt his face off. I do think he created himself as a focal point of this offense. Okay. I can't imagine you do what he did down the stretch and you come into the next season well, let me, where you you really do need weapons still. You've got Cooper, but you know Elijah Moore showed he's just not oh that my guy. Gosh. They, Mo- they don't have another guy. It's 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 a, it's those Most two. annoying players in the NFL, Elijah Moore, <laughs> is on the upper. Let me ask you this. No draft consideration. You just have to put one of them on your team next year and lock them in your tight end spot. George Kittle, David Njoku. No draft cost. I'll take no, no I'll draft take cost. Kittle. I'll still go Kittle. Okay. Just wanted to see where that buzz was. Cole Komet finished at seven. Look Cons- at that. Consistency rank of 11. First half of the year, he was seventh in consistency. Second half, 18. Against all odds. Busted 29% of the time. Good 41%. Great 12%. Honestly, I feel like Cole Komet was one of the least talked about players in fantasy this past year. Yeah. Um, because the lows at times were very low. Dealt with some injury. So people didn't play him even on weeks when he did perform. Like the Arizona game, you know, he was banged up going into it. Ends up at number five on the week. I don't know how many people had him in the lineup. Justin Fields missed time. Saw a ton of red zone targets. And honestly, the Cole Komet discussion, like, I feel like we have to just tell you what happened and then wait to have the discussion. We don't know who the quarterback's going to be. We don't know if they're going to invest. They have two high picks. So if you tell me next year you're going in with – you know, Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze. Right. Right. Cole yeah, Komet yeah. is we're probably gonna be out. I I believe the important takeaway from Cole Komet, um, even though he he wasn't a great fantasy asset this year from how things played out, he still actually impressed me on the field film wise. He had some big boy man style catches, especially around the end zone. And so, yeah, we don't know what what the entire organization looks like going next year, what his target competition is, but um, I rose on Cole Komet. Like, I I rose a little bit in just how I think of him as a player, as a talent. And so, that I mean, that's really the only thing you can do right now is judge, do you think he's good? Do you think he's talented? Do you think he's capable if given the opportunity? Or is he just a guy? And I And I went more from just a guy to – I think he's pretty talented. Jake Ferguson at eight, 25 years old, was not drafted, so he was a great value. He's the guy I'm going to be drafted next year everywhere. Interesting. I just I think he'll be left for dead, or at least be like the, the tight end 10. He'll be in the late rounds. I don't even know how. I, I It's good to hear that because I don't know how to think about him. I really don't. Like Jake Ferguson, is he – like focal point is not the word I'm ever going to relate to Jake Ferguson. Well, not I, when you got CeeDee Lamb. Well, yeah, and I, I just feel like um, – He was actually – He just feels like the guy you end up eventually throwing the ball to is how it felt. Yeah, I mean, he had 102 targets, and I can say that, you know, I, I, I had this experience. It wasn't always great, but I had Ferguson for a lot of the season in our primary league, and I, I'd pay attention and be watching those games, and high-value targets were there. Um, 25 red zone targets that led the tight end position. Yeah, I mean, I, I he was looked to, and it didn't always connect. It didn't always work, and maybe that's just how it will forever be. But when I watched, I was like, I am happy to have this role in Dak's team. That's basically how I view it. Cheap Ingram? Yeah, cheap Ingram, exactly. And In and, terms of just and, somebody you lock in every week and you're like, I've got my tight end position figured out. It might not win me the week, but – I can go find my upside elsewhere. Exactly right, and it costs you nothing, and I think there's higher touchdown upside with Ferguson, who yes. got red zone targets, yes. and versus Ingram, who's never scored touchdowns, and I would give me Dak over, uh, give me expensive Trevor Lawrence this it, year. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. It, it, it was essentially, it, it, like it was his, it was Ferguson's first year as a starter. His rookie season, he played 37% of the snaps. He had 22 targets. So he was put into a role uh, as a second-year player that he can still get better mm-hmm. as an actual player. Now he, the the Cowboys did take Luke Schoonmaker, a.k.a. the Schoonman, Schoonmaker. In, 
in the second round of this past year. Eight receptions that, as a rookie. Yeah, I'm just, it's I'm not saying that the Schoon man is definitely coming for Ferguson's job, but it's a at least there is a high draft capital pick who could be in competition. I think Ferguson it's his job. So I'm I'm more on Jason's side of the like right now tight like end ten in basketball, touchdown upside every single week. I I'm, he's an interesting player. It seems like this role in Dallas's offense is to be the tight end eight to ten. Dalton Schultz the year before was the tight end ten. Ferguson old, ends up at tight end eight. Old man Witten was always still yeah. It's there. not it's not going to be prolific, but it's not going to let you down. At number nine, we have much more excitement. It's Trey yes. McBride. Trey McBride finished at nine, consistency of ten, but in the second half was a consistency of three. He took over. Zacherts was waived. His pace from week uh, week six on was 103 receptions, over a thousand yards. And four touchdowns. Well, in the first five weeks, he wasn't even – he was barely a part of this mm – -hmm. barely a part of this offense when, when Zach Ertz was there. He played 39% of the snaps in the first five weeks and basically was – I mean, he had a grand total – let me count them here through those weeks <laughs> – eight receptions through five <laughs> weeks. And, and then he was like, hey, let's get that guy on the field. The the worry I have with Trey McBride is the um, the draft price. I, I think, and I agree. Like like it was a prolific week six on, but you know, a hundred receptions, a thousand yards, four touchdowns. Will Arizona score a lot next year? What is the potential touchdown totals for Trey McBride? You know, um, Trey McBride next year or David Njoku? No draft consideration. Oh, easily Trey McBride. Trey McBride. Um, so there you go. Just because of the PPR value. You think he's going to catch it's, more passes? It's, it's and the quarterback. Yeah. So once Kyler returned, he was on pace for uh, 112, uh, 1143 yards. Still only four touchdowns, but the touchdowns can go up. It. It's just the fact that Trey McBride <clears throat> can take over games where he. It. it well, we'll see if the how the NFL draft goes. The the chalk of the draft right now is Marvin Harrison Jr. ends up as an Arizona Cardinal. And by all the the chatter out there, he is a essentially a day one alpha. You just put him out there, and that's you know what the draft people are saying about Marvin Harrison. But to have even if that happens, if Trey McBride is clearly the number two target um, in for the Arizona Cardinals and a player who can actually take over, where most tight ends can't take over a game, so that's what the interesting thing is. That's why people are drafting him as we said, as the tight end three right now in best ball because the upside is massive, but he is going to – he's one of my favorite players right now, but that is a – that's a rich ADP. Like you're making a really, really big bet. Yeah, and, and this isn't a player that came out of nowhere. It, it, last yeah, year, yeah. he was a rookie tight end. He did nothing, um, but he was the first drafted NFL tight end. Uh, a round two pick. A round, not just round two. He was pick number – Oh. <laughs> Oh, he's destined for greatness. He's destined for this show, <laughs> T. McBee. So, I, yeah, I, uh, I, I like his talent, his opportunity, and his breakout. Kittle or McBride? McBride. Dalton Schultz finishes at 10 for the second consecutive year. He was last year's tight end 10. He's this year's tight end 10. Um, you know, pretty good season, pretty good run, had some injuries, but if you look at you know, if you isolate it a bit to weeks four through 12, it was a really good run. He was a consistency rank of eight. He he got it done. I don't know how involved he was on a lot of fantasy squads, but from weeks four, four weeks through 11, where... he was the tight end three in fantasy points per game. And C.J. Stroud obviously elevated everybody in Houston, 47% good, 13% great, 40% bust. Well, well and it's TBD because Dalton Schultz was on a one-year deal, so we'll see where he actually – uh, ends up, I, I believe, right? Kyle? Yes, he is. Yeah. He is a free Baby, okay. come back. <laughs> so, I, it seems like Dallas is it, what I'm hearing. <laughs> no, I'm just, kid I'm just kidding. Uh, it, it seems like this is a situation where the team and the player can work it out. Uh, I mean, if, if he comes back, I'm very interested. If he goes somewhere else and doesn't have C.J. Stroud, <laughs> no, no it's thank so, you. It's so funny because yes. you just said what you said last year. Yes, you, you were like. If he comes back to Dallas, I'm very interested. Yep. Yeah. If he goes to Houston with a rookie quarterback, yeah. not interested in Dalton Schultz. The truth is, is he's he's the I, he's, I don't blame the process. He's yeah, a quarterback's best friend. I remember being 
the one fighting you guys a little bit about Dalton Schultz this past off season. Yeah, and by week the end of week three, me and Jay were just yeah, you were singing we're, songs. We were, we we're burying him into the ground. Twelve was Mark Andrews. Just some other names to throw out there. Mark Andrews was number two in consistency. Mark Andrews is still great. Mark Andrews, um, very good. I will mention. I believe Isaiah Likely is very good. So that was part of the discussion before the season. Isaiah Likely is a uh, – like if Isaiah Likely was alone in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Be he finished the year at 4-4, 2-8. Um, that was fantasy finishes. Like we would be – he'd be inside the top six. Yes. So when you have a player that is 23 years old emerging and then you have a player that has not been necessarily able to always stay on the field even though he is very, very good – I just want that conversation to be in the back of your head. Um, Mark Andrews finished at four, five, one, and four before this year with the injuries. Uh, points per game wise, he was right there again. Yeah, he was eleven point three. Travis Kelsey was eleven point five. So you you know I don't know if you're going to factor Isaiah Likely into anything next year or not. I don't know if that'll be a, a like a I don't difference think maker if you're like right on the edge with two players. Yeah, like I, if you're sitting Trey McBride and Mark Andrews. Is likely going to factor into you? I don't. I don't think I so. I, I think likely will be involved, but I don't think it necessarily siphons away from Andrews. I think it's just a newer weapon in the offense. They 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 have a real wide receiver problem with Bateman and and Odell Beckham. Goddard came in at fourteen, consistency of fifteen. Really a lost year for Goddard, and maybe maybe we retire him. Yeah, I think he. You know, it's it's not always. You know, there's hot and cold, and then there's Goddard, <laughs> which he, is like re it's not red light, green light. It's like red light, red light, red light, green light, red light, red light, yellow light, red yeah, light. There's a green lot light. of yellow, yeah. a lot of yellow lights there. Um, which is just enough to get through. He's following in the footsteps footsteps of Zach Ertz uh, for the Eagles, which is become uh, a guy who can catch the ball and fall down. You mean old Zachers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Young yeah, yeah. Zachers no, no, no. for the Eagles was well, a better footsteps to step in. Absolutely. He's following the footsteps because young, younger Dallas Goddard was really good for a while. And then it's like, yeah, I'm just going to catch the ball three yards from here and then get five yards on the play. Yeah, I mean, honestly, this is year – this will be year seven for Dallas Goddard. He's never finished above 10 at the tight end position. And he's never – this was his – would you believe it's his career high in receptions? Because because it, it was that's insane. Yeah, so I mean, he never he never broke out. Right. Goddard just we waited for it. He was an anticipatory draft pick. He did not break out, and his draft capital you spent. He was a tight end seven off the board. You had to invest a sixth round pick to get him, um, which is high enough to where you probably put him in your lineup and waited, mm -hmm. and low enough to where you know. I don't know. Massive, it's, massive. He's bust this huge year. break. He's a bust. He's the third receiving option for a team that doesn't have a ton of passing volume, and the the first and second option are they're elite. So like, much it's, better. It's not just good wide receivers on the Eagles. It's it's top tier elite players. So it it, it makes sense that he would ne like never really get the the breakout. This season did not make sense to me of how they were utilizing him. So we'll see if. Uh, after they're shifting some things up with the offense, maybe we get some hope. But in draft season, I can't imagine I will be calling well, I, for it. You know, if he follows the uh, Ingram Njoku year seven plan. <laughs> yeah, this is the maybe. year. All right, couple mentions here at the end. We'll have a Tuesday show with our Super Bowl reaction, some mailbag to talk through, any news. Maybe we'll reflect on Kelsey's performance in the Super Bowl and what we think then. Uh, the UDK presale starts on Sunday. That's ultimatedraftkit.com. You'll want to head over there on Sunday. It is the lowest possible price for the Ultimate Draft Kit, and the UDK Plus comes with the Dynasty Pass uh, with a ton of tools and resources. Did you guys want to talk about that? Yeah, I, I did. We we have been really scouring through our Dynasty rankings, uh, setting those up, all of our startup rankings, our rookie rankings, getting everything ready for Super Bowl Sunday. And it, it, like it, it's just on my mind so much because we're living in this. I, even going through these tight ends, I'm thinking about how you know they they rank in dynasty, and all that information will be available on Super Bowl Sunday, so you could take a look at at all the 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 values, the trade targets, the uh, the rankings, so that you can go make your early dynasty trades and take advantage 
of those who don't have that resource. There are three updates to the Dynasty Pass every year, which is the pre-combine release on Sunday, the post-combine, and the post-NFL draft. All of our rookie rankings, dynasty rankings, college production profiles, rookie mock drafts, and a whole lot else. Team uh, opportunity pages are awesome. Yeah, team opportunity pages showing what every team is going to need this offseason as you prepare. It's, it's a great resource to know what dynasty assets to potentially trade away mm -hmm. before teams fix problems and make you, you know, suddenly you're like, well, okay, didn't expect that, but now, you know, Kenneth Walker is not as valuable or whatever the case may be. So you can watch the show over on YouTube. A reminder, subscribe over on YouTube.com slash the fantasy footballers. Click the bell. It's a nice little wave by Jason. Yeah. I'm, oh, it there's was, a wave to YouTube. It was, yeah. it was very coy. So, yeah, Fantasy Hitman's trade targets is part of the of uh, the Dynasty Pass as yes, well. Yes, sir. So, Sunday, we'll send out some emails. We'll let you know on social media. Follow us over there at the FF Ballers. That'll do it for today's episode of the show. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the big game. I hope it is a good time. Enjoy your food, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.